Listen. My fortune. What do we have, Captain? We have land, Mr. Murray. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of UELFG, where we find a party to share what they've learned from game making. I am your host, Tina, and today with me, I have the wonderful developers of Forever Skies with me here today. And uh, I would like to give a moment before we dive in to introduce the two of them. So would both of you like to tell us a little bit about yourselves and about the game that we're going to be playing today? Yeah, sure. So, hi, hello, uh, and uh, thank you for, for inviting us here. Uh, my name is Andrzej Blanfeld. I am CEO and Gameplay Lead uh, at Far From Home. Um, just really quickly, Far From Home is a small independent studio from Poland, uh, made mostly by experienced developers that, you know, have experience working on a different, maybe sometimes bigger games uh, from AAA studios. Um, and we wanted uh, to create something uh, like combining the cool quality of, of uh, big games with uh, this cool creativity that is able, this is like, you know, the part of an indie development. So, so that's, that's uh, one of the things why Far From Home exists. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing is mostly I'm trying to uh, make sure that gameplay is fun to play. Uh, I'm trying to help with all the things that I could do. And besides of that, I'm responsible for work, uh, for business, a lot of uh, some part of marketing, and so on, and so on. And with us is Greg. Uh, so Greg. Hi. Yeah. Uh, my name is Greg Cummings. Uh, I'm the community manager here at Far From Home. Uh, this is actually my first project in the video game industry for Sky. So I'm really excited to show everyone here on the stream uh, what it is that we're working on. 
like I say, this is my first project. Before this, I was a streamer and content creator. That's sort of my way in. And yeah, I uh, look forward to showing what this is all about from uh, my side. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for coming here today. Very excited to play this game and get into it. Um, for some quick context for anyone who might not know, this is the very first episode of UELFG. Very excited about it. And for this, we're gonna be we're gonna be playing games, and I'm gonna be bothering these two with questions throughout it. <laughs> so, as well as you chat, if anyone has questions to go through on any of the gameplay or questions about certain assets or just comments and stuff you have. Let us know. We're much here to hang out and play games. It's going to be a good time. <laughs> so that's my phone going off. I should have put that on silent about five minutes ago. <laughs> oh wow. I thought you were a professional, Greg. <laughs> yeah, so did I. So did I, till just then. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, let's, let's dive in, shall we? Let's pull it up and get in there. Okay. So uh, we're going to start off then, um, and I've got a save ready to go from here, so. Yeah, so very quickly about Forever Skies. So Forever Skies is FPP survival game. You are a lone scientist that is returning uh, on Earth long after a global ecological catastrophe that made Earth unable for people to live anymore. Um, so this is like a very first moment. It's it's a beginning of our probably full game, but what we're playing right now is a demo that was prepared like three months ago. So uh, even from our perspective, some things that we are watching right now are a little bit like we right now game could look some a little bit different. Uh, what is cool right now, what we are seeing is that Earth is completely covered with poison dust. So um, it was. One of the, I would say, biggest challenge for us, how to create, you know, that environment, how to create that look that will, from one side, will be the unique look. So, you know, when you're just gonna take a screenshot of our game, you will know, okay, this is forever, guys. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a complicated process of how we can do it, how we can do it. Uh, in our case, uh, it was mostly by this co the, the colors and mostly by, by, by dust and, of course, the ruins. Um, that, are, that are around. So, of course, during your journey, uh, one of the most important things will be to uh, collect resources. So it's a survival game. You need to make sure that you will be able to you know, survive. And from survival perspective, uh, there is like a pyramid of needs. So uh, you need to take care of your health, you need to take care of your hunger, thirst, and so on. Um, yeah, and I think it was really cool because we were able to use game playability system for it. Uh, so it was quite easy. Uh, when we started working on Forever Skies, we were trying to figure out how to make sure that we are fulfilling the fantasy of that you are a scientist in a world. So we needed to make sure, you know, what kind of tools we want to create that will fulfill that, that, that premise. Um, I think it's it's cool that uh, it was really hard from the very beginning to you know like fully realize what will be uh, like enjoyable, enjoyable from perspective of gameplay or fun for the players. So we started as a studio of prototyping and creating the list of the proper tools that may be cool to, to create. And one of them was a scanner. So your basic tool that allows you to uh, learn about things in a game, understand how you can use it, what's the uh, backstory of it, and so on and so on. And it's related with database. So this is exactly what Greg is showing right now, uh, where all the information are gathered. And as a player, you will be able to um, like learn some, not only uh, descriptions, but sometimes more important stuff, like for example, uh, what is a possible way of use or what can cure some things. Uh, that, that you, you just scanned. Oh, uh, yeah, I see it there in the medicine list. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So there is a lot of survival game right now, you know, and we were trying to figure out, like, from the very beginning, what could be our, our unique selling points, you know, what can make you, like, stand out from 
crowd and, and so on. So um, as a as a team, we, we, we're trying to do as much as possible, you know, working around community-driven development or sometimes called marketing-driven development. But in our case for Forever Skies, what we did from the very beginning was like reading a lot of reviews of all the survival games to try to analyze what community is saying about them, what they like or not like, uh, and maybe trying to find something that maybe we could try to do, I wouldn't say better, but maybe uh, in a different way. And one of the things that we thought that can change a little bit um, the problem that sometimes when you're playing a survival game, you're getting to the point where gameplay is starting to be really um, similar. It's starting to be like very repetitive. Uh, we mm -hmm. thought that maybe we're gonna try to establish something that can change rules of gameplay. So because of that, and with the fantasy of you know the world that is covered with the dust, we we find that maybe we can try to uh, um, like create something that is called viruses in our game. Um, and by viruses are something that you can capture during your playthrough, and they are changing rules. So for example, you can see that right now, Greg is not able to watch directly the sun. Um, it's really cool from perspective that we are trying to create emergent gameplay. So. It's going to be introduced a little bit later, but you know, when you are thinking about, okay, what can be benefits or can be like uh, bad things of doing something like looking at the, uh, in the front of the sun, and you know, we have like day night cycle. So, for example, when you have something like that, maybe you will prefer to play during night, so you don't need to find a cure. But in our case, it's a tutorial, so um, we start, we, 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 we prepared everything so player is able to find a cure for the virus. Very generous of you. <laughs> <laughs> like, for example, these lobster chilies that we found here. Yeah. Which we can see here contains lecithin, which is the ingredient needed to cure the photophobia virus that we have. So we simply consume one of these, and the virus is neutralized. Yeah. So now we can see what can cause it and what, can, uh, what the medicine is needed. Yeah, but of course it's just a simple type of virus. Uh, just we wanted to introduce in a in a, in a very uh, in a very starting uh, scenario, so players can like understand the rules uh, during your playthrough. You will be able to catch more advanced uh, things, and you will need to learn, you know, a more advanced way of curing that kind of viruses. Um, and even further in a, in a gameplay, uh, which we are not showing right now, uh, I think we are not talking about too much right now about it, but you will be able to change viruses. So like use them as a busters to change gameplay for your advantages. Yeah, so um, I think it's cool story behind what's happening here. So we are at the roof where is our ship. Mm, and uh, we had a cool problem here. So when we started to, to creating that, that, that part of a game uh, and we were in a playtest mode, we saw that players are leaving ships. They didn't was able to notice that this is the airship where they should go. Um, it, it like came out rather quickly for us. We, we saw it on the streamers uh, when, when they were streaming our game and uh, we we're trying to figure out, okay, what we can do with it. And uh, it's a moment when player is walking through uh, stairs, the doors are automatically opening. So sometimes people are asking, what, what, what the hell is going on here? But from that moment, every player knew exactly that they need to go to the ship, and this is the ship that we are talking about. Uh, and that it will be really important, but I will tell you a little bit more about the ship in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so one of the big part of our game is that you need to build, you need to expand the ship. Uh, so we will be able to fly away from that from that location. Um, to be able to build and expand the ship, you need to gather more resources. And these two uh, allow you to extract uh, resources from different objects. And again, cool story, we had a huge problem because there is a lot of floating debris on the sky, as you can see. Uh, players were not able from the very beginning to see that uh, they can extract them. So we needed to find a way how to learn people that they can do it. And uh, mm. one of the things we realized is that maybe we can script that 
when you are like extracting the wall in front of the ship, always one of the debris will fly in front of you. So you are not able to skip that part. Uh, and from that moment, <laughs> players were realizing, ah, OK, so this can be extracted too. And it solved the problem. But um, it was like, you know, really, uh, really important to realize that we need to make sure that UX is working pretty well. So people are yeah. able to understand the rules uh, and, and yeah, our sure. intentions behind it. Exactly. Um, I have a quick question for you, if you don't mind. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people are very fascinated with the particles, especially for uh, when you are mining the resources. Was there, did first, did you end up using um, Niagara for those or how did you implement those? Yeah, so they, they are made on Niagara. Mm. I'm, it will be really hard for me to go very deeply because it, it was our friend who made them. But uh, we we did a lot of researches. We tried to you know find how to uh, find to do it in a in a in a, in a technical way. Uh, but if you want to go in a more details about how to how to make them, uh, we can gladly try to respond uh, to, 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 to that question. Um, but yeah, it was really important for us to get the feeling that you are actually extracting these particles from object and it disappearing. Um, and Greg, if you could like use it on a, on a building on the left side. Yeah, <clears throat> I was building up to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the building on the left hand side, right, I see what you're talking about, right. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to so, show here. something something more. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I did not realize the building could that. collapse. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. The yeah, building so, can collapse. <laughs> exactly. So, so destruction. You know, what, one thing was that we tried to you know, create that really realistic uh, particles that, that shows what's happening. But again, it's a survival game. And we wanted to make sure that this is a feeling that it's part of a world. So it's the world is really destroyed. It's, it's, it's like a collapsed, it's like a ruin of Earth that previously people were living here. So it was really one of our biggest objective, how to make the, the, the destruction of the building and so on. From the beginning, we thought that it would be um, very complicated. I would say, it, of course it is, but um, thanks of the technology, it, it wasn't so, so bad, I believe. Um, if you can go, Greg, to the, to the room that you opened, I wanted to yeah, show something absolutely. for here. Thanks. I'll just put this away for a second. Yeah, oh, the engine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, we'd be, from the starting, we thought that it would be really cool if we can try to create some Easter egg inside, even if it's a, just a demo. So we put that poster here. Uh, and from the very beginning, people don't really knew what is it. But uh, it's one of our concept art of under dust locations. So what does it mean is that right now we are presenting only the word above the dust. Yeah, you are just only able to see gameplay uh, on the ruins of the buildings. But when you progress in a game, you will be go to under the dust. Uh, yeah, and this was our like small sneak peek about what's gonna happen there. Uh, even people are asking what kind of enemies you could expect. Uh, what's going to be there. And uh, to be honest, it could be seen on this concept art. <laughs> yeah. Um, sneak a bit closer. Very sneaky. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, and Greg, oh, if you could no. just for one second, there is like even the way how you're going to go there. So uh, there is a small elevator where players are going below the dust. So this was like one of the very first concepts we created. Uh, when we were thinking about the, the locations below us and how the world could look there, um, mm. but yeah, this is—I believe it's a story for a different uh, of different meeting. Um, and I wanted to say, you know, that this the, 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 this part, the few few hours or the few minutes of of the starting locations uh, that uh, we discussed right now was like. I, I wanted to tell you a little bit, bit more about how we do it from the production perspective. So um, 
this we knew that we want to create a demo and our like uh, cool goal was that maybe we will be able to uh, participate in a Steam Next Fest, but we were not sure if demo, if the game is ready for it. It was like maybe one month before Steam Next Fest uh, that, that happened three months ago that we were thinking, yeah, let's try, but how we can do it? So um, we decided that we're gonna go in a direction like rather safe way. So first of all, we try to find the right partner. We talk with the different companies uh, to get like something like a rapport. So uh, we find a, a business partner in Poland uh, that allowed us to um, create a test uh, that players were um, invited to office, their office, and psychologists were watching how they are playing to give us rapport of what working and not working. Um, when we were sending this build, we were like pretty convinced that it will be okay, it will be really good, you know. Uh, but report that came said that yeah, maybe you should like you know improve few things before you will be releasing a game uh, to to public audience. Mm. And who cool thing is that report like listed everything that needed to be done there? Yeah, so we knew that okay, we need to make some mechanics more clear. We need to add some more um, highlights on a on a location so player would be better guided, and so on and so on. Uh, so our approach was that we tried to implement the, the things from feedback during just two weeks, uh, and then. Uh, we needed to make sure that we are going in a good direction, but we didn't have time to create another, you know, like the, the test that we've analyzed, the psychologists and so on. So we needed to try our, find a way how we can do it by ourselves. Um, and we decided that we're gonna um, talk about close play test of our game. And so we put it on our Discord channel, we put it on our social media, and we gather, I don't, I rem I don't remember the exactly number, but Greg, do you remember? It was like 3,000 people that wanted to play this our game? Yeah, something like that, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 3,000 so, people along, along those lines. Yeah, but still, you know, this number was huge for us. We were like so stressed, but, uh, and why? <laughs> <laughs> games right games right now you know needs to be like really good performing you need to have really optimized stuff you need to be sure that they are like not crashing and so on and so on uh, and we did like as a developers we were like afraid if three thousands of people would tell us you know it's work it's not working so uh, we try to establish a way how to get feedback and uh, make sure that we are able to deliver a game on a, on a steam next fest so um, our approach for this was that for the seven days, each day we were like giving players the build, but only limited number of the players. So for example, first day was like maybe 50 people got invited to play a demo and we get, if you could uh, press escape for just a second, Greg. So we had a very important button here, it's called send feedback. And it allows player to open our web page and write feedback to us. Uh, so with that and with surveys that we're creating, we're able to analyze what's going on and to see if everything is okay. From that moment, I believe it was every day we were patching the demo, like every day. It still wasn't public, but we were like, okay, we need to optimize that. We need to add the settings for, I don't know, field of view. Uh, we, or different other things. So we're like working very hardly uh, for seven days. And then four hours before Steam Next Fest was like going public, uh, was, was starting, we gathered together and made the decision if we're ready to it. You know, we're like just after like close to this 3,000 uh, 3, uh, 3, and maybe more people played it. We got the, uh, we got the feedback. And then we decided four hours before, okay, let's send press kit to media. Let's, you know, send it to streamers, YouTubers. We are ready to launch it. Um, yeah, I believe it was really yeah. cool. And it's really important to, from our perspective, was that we needed to be really prepared for it. It's like as a small company, as a, you know, as a new title, the first impression is really important. So we needed to make sure that everything will, will work perfect just for it. Uh, 
still it's really stressful even for for people for sure <laughs> yeah so i think one thing we should probably quickly show uh, andre was the uh the the battery thing that our community helped us helped us discover so yeah. these batteries uh they're a mechanic that you will find throughout the game they're used to power doors different ways in but they're also very useful for creating sort of more specialist tools as well uh, now this one has to stay in this slot otherwise you can see the doors over there close behind you but mm. play testers are fantastic what they actually can find and find ways to sort of circumvent rules that we put in place uh, a lot of <laughs> our players actually discovered that instead of leaving take leave, instead of you know just leaving the battery as we intended they found an even better mm -hmm. way so what they actually did was they took the battery they found a gap behind the stairs and players can play testers can probably do this a lot better than i can but you just hop up here and crouch <laughs> and you get behind the door without with sorry with the battery in place so you know something like we actually made the decision to let's just leave it in <laughs> because oh, you know let's let's reward their creativity <laughs> For real, rather Lover. than remove it. So yeah. So now we've got a battery. At this stage of the, in the game, you shouldn't have a battery, but I do, which means I can create the build tool a lot sooner than what I would. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I know, love play testers. The, they would... can find the yeah the weirdest ways to break things. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but because we decided that we want to keep it, from our perspective, it was like something that makes our community discussing it, you know? So someone like a put image of very advanced shift. And then they are asking, okay, how you do that? So then there was recorded a video, how to cheat, how to, you know, be able to build that and so on and so on. <laughs> so um, I believe it, it, it helped us a lot with building, you know, interest about game. Uh, and this is one of the advice we could always like say. So don't be afraid that people will break your game. They will definitely do. But if you could like try to make sure that if they're gonna do it, they will have fun. It's it's, it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I think it'd be really funny if we put a stop sign there for early access, like you know, like you see on the road, just like stop people mm. from climbing behind the stairs. I think I also think that would be really funny. But let's see what happens. <laughs> Uh, yeah. well, I'm Do you remember how people managed to get Infinity's class resource here? Uh, you know, uh, oh, no. the community being more than willing to tell me—they've not been shy about hiding that kind of information. But, okay, uh, I, I can't so, think how they how they went about it. No. So the, the, there was like a different limitation, yeah. So some builds, uh, some some part of the ships requires from you glass. And as I remember, there is a small glitch with saves. So players were able to throw away item from inventory, then cliff a game, return, and for some reasons it was safe two times. So they were like able to duplicate every item and build, made uh, the whole ship made fr just from glass. Yeah, it was like. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Did you leave that yeah, one in too, or people. is that one? Oh yeah. We left that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Time consuming. That's a commitment, you know? That is, that's a time commitment, and I feel like they've earned it at that point. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, I think I'm going to fly away now. Yeah. So, um, about our work, yeah? So, um, this is like very important moment for the player during a demo. It was the very first time they could fly away. And we believe that there is a lot of players waiting for that moment. Um, what we did here is that from, we wanted to make it like super important. That's why we put this, this, this title screen here. So welcome to forever skies. This is the starting moment. Uh, what we did here too is that we made the time limitation. So you could spend all the time on a starting location, but when you're starting flying, uh, you were at the very beginning limited to uh, spend only 20 minutes around the game, then it was ending. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a few minutes we'll like tell a little bit more why we did it and how, how it was important from perspective of uh, wishlist numbers and so on. But 
we wanted to focus of creating uh, introductions to our gener uh, to our work, and it was our work is mostly procedural generated. I mean, so every time we are starting the demo, it should have a different layout. You have you, you will have find the location in a different order, but because it's just a demo, we are mostly focused on just one type of location. So it's just you know a premise, uh, but it's not like a full experience of a world that will be in a full game. Um, yeah, and about locations, again, huge part of them is exploration. So as a scientist, you are trying to find new resources, trying to find uh, new tools that will allow you to proceed, uh, proceed during, during the gameplay. And all the, gener the, all the locations are like, we have a two part of generation. We have a word that is placing different locations in different orders, but all the locations that we are playing right now is created by tiles that could be randomized. So we are able to get, create a different um, gameplay, to make a gif different play uh, game feel uh, on, a, on, a, on a locations of, I would say, the same type. And a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things because we tried to uh, make the demo living part, a uh, living thing. So uh, in one of the updates, we added the Christmas event uh, because we are like mostly preparing for a full release of the game. Um, we need to, you know, spend a little time of making some idea of what to do with it right now because it's part of a game. We are like one month after Christmas, and it's still here, so we need to decide what to do with it. I mean, I can relate to that. I know I leave my Christmas tree up until probably June, most of the time. Wow. <laughs> you might just this leave feels it on that stage. <laughs> I would like to say it's because I'm festive and not because I'm lazy, but well. <laughs> right. This is beautiful, by the way. I just can't get over... I mean, even the, the small bits of environment that we get to see is beautiful, but especially looking up and out, I besides the fact that we are we have this eerie, green, acidic, horrible radiation-filled <laughs> air, it is beautiful <laughs> to look out and just see the, the horizon there. Mm -hmm. Definitely, mm. definitely. Yeah, good, good to hear, you know, that, that, but yeah. uh, sometimes we are hearing that uh, people are worried what's going to be next, you know, like after spending so, so sometimes in, in that environment with did colors, what's going to be next. Uh, so it was one of the things uh, we tried to, you know, tackle in a, as a serious thing for the future. So in a game, you will be able to see, like, we are calling it a different biome. So, for example, not always everything will be just green. Uh, and we are, mm. like... Giving, trying to uh, create a different types of uh, surroundings for the locations. Uh, so, for example, sometimes there is like more uh, like overgrown plants. Uh, they are taking locations around. Sometimes there is like more uh, uh, small things. Like they are giving a, the feeling that this was like more urban city uh, or something like that. But we are like got a lot of feedback around that that people love what they saw. They just want more, so we are trying to prepare a lot of different, uh, different uh, view and different locations for them. Right. Yeah, Greg, could you put so like more food inside? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah. I, uh, I yes, I, absolutely. I can. The... I'm we could get some more water. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. It's, please do. It's... Sorry. It's, actually, it's in regards to the water and stuff, because um, I can see that we have the different meters there off to the side for, I think it was energy, health, food, and, and water, right? Um, yeah, that's right. So you've got your stamina at the top there, then health, uh, then, yeah, food and water uh, below. That's right. Yeah. So I'm assuming you probably die if those get too low, but what what exactly goes on with these? Um, so, it's kind of cool because, I mean, stamina uh, is usually filled by drinking energy drinks or crafting a, bre uh, crafting a bed. 
and sleeping. Okay. Health, uh, you will you will die obviously naturally if that goes to zero. Uh, <laughs> food and water, as that as that starts to deteriorate, like the you know your vision will go blurry, uh, and then if you if you ha haven't eaten by the time the bar hits it, it's the end, then yeah you will also die from that as well. Um, but all four bars feed into uh, this circle, which you can see in the bottom left, which is your immunity uh, circle, which works into how much, when you, if you get diseased in the game, how much it, uh, it affects you or how much food and water does for the player as well. So oh. it all kind of works in unison. There we go, and I'm going to cook, cook some more boiled melon. Uh, so, did, did you uh, want me to go yeah, to another hey, location, hey, Andre? Just one thing, you know, I wanted to show something with the cooking pot. Uh, I believe it's really cool because um, we try to make sure that everything they are putting inside of it, it's like have a visual impact. So, the whole device is representing actual level of water. So, if you're like putting inside full like uh, bottle of water, then it will be fully filled. If not, then just lowering. But then if you put like, for example, melon, if you put inside the chili pepper, if you're gonna put like different things that you can cook, always you're gonna see it. And we created different materials for the moment where, for before cooking and after cooking. And even if something is like um, cooked, you can try to cook it again. And then we have a, again, yeah, like different model, different materials with overcooked fig. So we have here a boiled melon. So this one has already been cooked. Yeah. Let that cook a little bit. And now oh, it's not no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other cool thing with, and... with meals, uh, what we prepared is that it can be like. Um, I don't know how to say it in English, Greg, that, you know, it's like over time, it's not meant to be eaten. It's, it's, it's going to be uh, it's poison for you. So you, it's gone off. Yeah. yeah. So, Just, yeah it's, it's poison. Yeah. It's poison. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. You can, you, <laughs> so if you like That's waiting nice. with millions in your back patch for the very too long, you are in a bad situation, but always you can try to cook it. And maybe after cooking, it will be a little like healthier for you, but still, you should probably like aim to eat uh, more clean, clean uh, more fresh food uh, in our game. Uh, Greg, uh, maybe we can like show how works our uh, fishing in game. Shaking. Say that again, sorry. Fishing. fishing. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe. I'll I'll set off and I'll show off the fishing. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So yeah, because I'll head off towards this guy's area. So we had, you know, that kind of issue about if you are flying, we need to make sure that player is able to survive. And it's hard to tell you, yeah, you always need to get, get, fly with water in your back, with your back patch and to fly with your food. So we needed to find a way how to make player be able to survive during his um, travel south. So it was like huge challenge from the, uh, from the design perspective because we needed to make sure that Fuel is not needed for like you know gathering water. The fuel is not needed for gathering food, uh, but we needed to create a tools that player will be able to handle every situation. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure how we find the idea behind fishing rod. I think it was like someday someone said, "Let's try to fish something that is from below the dust." Okay. <laughs> And all good games have a have a have a uh, have a fishing mini games. It's also exactly. Great. I'm so excited so. about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Comes in two parts. There's the actual rod itself, and then there's the uh, the lure that you attach to it. Yeah, it, it couldn't be too easy. Just give that a minute, and maybe we'll be able to catch something. I'm just crafting some more fuel, because you always need fuel. Ah, here we go. Can you hear that?
And we have a moth. A dawn moth. Yeah. So at the oh, minute, it so won't do you an awful lot if you eat it how it is. Uh, as you can see there, it says you gain some food, but also it will negatively affect your water and your health. So that's why we cook it. And also, I picked up a mug from that location, so let's place that on the airship. Yeah. As we can see, it now gives you plus all through food, water, and health. So there are benefits to cooking your food, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and the other thing, it's cool with it, it allows you to cure the virus, the sun air issue. So you, like, again, if you are in a, in a bad situation, you are flying and you are, like, valuable for a, for a sun, then you can try to cook a mole and maybe you will be saved by that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Another Christmas tree? So, <laughs> yeah. So sometimes when you are tra traveling around the locations, you are able to find like devices that can help you. But mostly, what you are what we are what, what you are looking for are a new blueprints. So blueprints are the things that like are new schemes for the things that you are able to print or you are able to uh, build on your ship uh, and enjoy project oxygen. oxygen. Um, I don't know if people know about it. I mean, maybe some, some, not all, probably. But Project Oxygen was our previous title, working title for Forever Skies. So before everyone knows the, the, the original name, we, we called it just Project Oxygen. Um, and yeah, this is the poster for a very long time ago. When, when it was our first promo art. I'll put it up in the air. Uh, yeah, shoot that down. <laughs> this yeah. is awesome. That was our that was our original uh, key art for Project Oxygen, which is now a poster. Yeah. I think it Perfect. was one year ago. Yeah, it was definitely one year ago when we, uh, after two two years, you know, after we started company and started working on a, on a game, it was the the only thing we showed uh, when we announced that Far From Home exists, uh, and I believe that it was really cool poster because. It, it, it was like grabbing a lot of attention from people. It was cool to, 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 to see the kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also great to have um, kind of the, the callback to your other projects and also repurposing your concept art for earlier stuff too. That way it gets to live on, have its moment. I really love that. I'll pick these back up so I can actually put the floor down. Yeah, there is like we, we from the very beginning we had a small problem and we still don't know how to give it the best idea. So to be able to expand your ship, to be able to build another rooms, you need to make sure that roof, floor, and so on that that the the, the place that uh, that you are building from is clear. You know there is not nothing. Um, stick to it. There is nothing put on on a floor, and so on, and so on. Um, it's from design perspective, it's quite cool because it allows us to um, be able to not um, be aware of if player is able to get back all the things like resources. Uh, it's, it solve a lot of problems, but from the other perspective, uh, it could be a little bit unintuitive. So we are still like trying to figure out what to do with that and. Should we allow the players to be able to to, to build in that in, in that way? This is awesome. I do have a. I see a question here. Um, how big is your current dev team, or how how many people do you have working on this project? So um, when we started, like three years ago, we we're. I would say mostly five persons. Right now, there is like 25 persons working. Uh, 
it's not only development team. I'm, I'm count, counting or marketing and administration too here. Um, I know it's some sometimes it's very stretched from indie perspective, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, we we decided that we want to make make help from people that know how to you know uh, create agreements and so on and so on. So yeah, we, we expanded. Yeah, for sure. That. Yeah. Uh, it really is such anything else? satisfying. Sorry? That is so satisfying. The like disintegration of collecting stuff. <laughs> it's, yeah. It is the perfect particle for that. It really is. It's a really cool fact. I love it too. Yeah. And I think you saw that we had a small problem from the very beginning. We wanted to make sure that players know where exactly to fly. So that's why we invited the idea with the lights on the location that have some kind of exploration on them. Uh, and from that point, we had like, at the moment of the game from the very beginning, you don't have map, you don't have radar. So it was like hard to player to understand where he was previously. And then we came to the idea that, OK, but where is electricity on this location? And when you saw the battery at the very beginning, this is the same batteries that are on the location. So if you took battery from the locations, the light is off. So from that moment, we saw that the players are exactly, no, they are knowing where they were and where they still need to go further. Um, in a demo, we are just using one color, but in a full game, you will have a different kind of colors, different kind of shapes of, of that lights. So we will always be able to, you know, see from, from distance that we are going in a, in a direction of some cool thing that you want to explore. Uh, but then we came to the idea that maybe it's just not enough. You know, the, the ship that, that, that you are able to fly um, could be not only horizontal, but could be too vertical. We know that from the very beginning, we don't want player to be able to go below the dust with ship. I mean, Greg can help, can try to do it, but if he will do it, then probably he will get damaged by that. Uh, maybe in future, we will try to introduce something that, you know, make you uh, be able to fly a little lower. Uh, but right now, uh, we started to think about, OK, what we can do to make a player want to fly higher. Uh, so we introduced device called Turbine. It like expands parameters of your ship because we are not only having parameters of player, but you know, we have like a, a speed of ship, you have your uh, fate of ship, you have like uh, ability to make it um, be, uh, like to, to, to be able to uh, expand more and so on and so on. So during a gameplay, you will try to build a different devices that will change how you are flying. Um, it was, I would say, a hard challenge for us because, you know, from one side you have this modular system that allows you to build that moving base just from tiles. And in the same time, you want to have the physicality of movement. You want to feel that this is actual ship that you are flying uh, in the sky. So, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was a cool challenge, I guess. It was fun. I, <laughs> I, I can definitely say it. I hope that our uh, the Jacek, who is our like guy the person responsible for creating the movement and the, the ship, uh, yeah. will, will will like say exactly the same. I hope so. I, I will know it <laughs> in a few minutes. Probably he will write to me. No, it was no, it wasn't far. But I hope it was. Uh, but yeah, after, <laughs> after but after after this few few, I would say even years, because I believe that it took us one year of development of trying to figure out how building systems should work. You know, there was like a lot of different approaches, a lot of different approaches about movement, about the physicality and so on. Um, right now, we are getting a lot of cool feedback from people that is working in a, in, a, in a very cool way. Of course, a lot of things could still change during early access um, because, oh, I think that we, I'm not sure if you mentioned that, but we are like, we are thinking of releasing the game first in early access. Uh, it's going to happen probably uh, I hope so. Yeah, it is going to happen in the first uh, first half of this year. Um, and we decided that yeah. we want to go from the very beginning in early access, uh, just to make sure that, you know, we are still very close to player. We are still very close to community to get feedback and to make sure that we are going in the direction that, that the game should go. Um, and I wanted to tell, uh, to say that because I believe that uh, it's 
very common mistake that sometimes people are focusing on creating game for themselves. You know, like uh, I heard that a lot of times. Yeah, I want to make that game to look like and be be, be, be playable in that way. And of course, it's, it could be a good way. But uh, in our case, we wanted to make sure that we are creating something that is is like connected. It's it's connected with needs, if uh, from players that they have that kind of fun. So that's why community-driven development. Uh, that's why we are like uh, gathering people around uh, a game on a Discord. We are like trying to uh, create surveys. Sometimes when we are designing something, we're asking, okay, what would you prefer? Is that the way? that we should go or maybe we should go in a different direction what was your experience in a different in the previous games you were playing and so on and so on so yeah that, that can be really natural that for, for that kind of game it would be really nice to have early access and be able to you know speak with players before we're gonna make this this game in a in a full version like when development will be much harder to, to change foundation of game right absolutely so it sounds like um, having that kind of open communication with your player base and your community through the whole process is a, a really big and important piece of the journey for you all, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know. as, the, as the community manager, um, it's kind of obviously part, one, of the, one of the big parts of my jobs is the connection between uh, the studio and obviously the player base and the, the community. So, you know, being community-led in terms of development is a it's a it's a it's a really really cool thing and you know the, you see so many examples through the years with other projects as well of, of people do the same things where you can really get like some really cool results by having the players help you alongside while you're still developing and that's why early access is obviously very important to us and yeah it's really really cool really cool definitely yeah i love that um, I feel like then it, it, it's also special for the players too, because they get to see their own feedback, oh, yeah. um, potentially impact like the like game so. as you. Yeah, <laughs> that's lovely. And um, I guess I it's a turbine. Had... We might as well show you what happens when you actually fly a bit higher. Yeah, we could. I mean, like, like we said, you know, we wanted to make sure that the game have verticality, so. It is the first moment where you actually are able to fly enough above the dust that you have like more clear vision of what's going on around. Wow. Yeah. But still you need fuel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you get it. Absolutely. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want me to go straight to the end of the demo then now, Andre? Uh, I think we can you now like spend a little bit more time playing and then seeing what's what's more is here. Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Just as the storm comes in. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so perfect time. This is, this is again, you know, something that was really important from us from the very beginning. We wanted to make sure that you have that feeling that this is living world. So. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there is a different weather conditions and they will have impact of how we are playing, what's happening in a game. Uh, I think that in a demo we decided to turn off the damage system. It's like you are not able to, to be able to destroy your ship. Uh, in a full game it's possible and one of the, um, one of the things that can damage you is, is a is thunderstorm that is, you know, the thunder can, can hit ship and can make you like on a fire and then you need to figure out what to do with it. Um, it was one of the very first things that we did. As I remember, it was like maybe two years ago when we had this small prototype and it was really awesome, you know, that feeling that there was like everything, like Thunderstorm was so intensive that everything was going completely dark and you just saw that heat lights, you know, just, just flashes of light and then there was like if the, the system, if ship was damaged enough, then all the um, lights on ships were like turning off, and then you need to use your flashlight to find what was destroyed and needs to repair it. Uh, it was really unique and, and cool feeling. Um, I hope that, that it will have part of of, of uh, full game too. 
Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like so much fun, but also so incredibly stressful. <laughs> Just yeah, a little was... flashlight. Yeah, but you know, that, that, that's why we needed to make sure that we are not pushing too much for the players. Like, uh, sometimes, I, like, we are seeing that there are players that want to have the very immersive, uh, highly, um, highly, um, I don't know, danger environment that they, they need to survive. But mm -hmm. because we have like a completely different world, it's not the, the earth that we know. It's, it's like it's evolved. It's, it's hard to recognize and to learn the basics. Even, you know, thinking about where we are gathering food or how we are gathering water, it's not easy to like, like it's not the first idea. Oh, I need to fish something from under dust. It's, it's not like basic first idea, you know? So because all the mechanics, all the things that we are creating are so completely different, we need to make sure that that learning curve is not like too stressful for players because like then we're gonna yeah. have a big problem so this was one of the things that we are learning still so like from the very beginning we created like a dozens of mechanics but right now we are just limiting w w where are the purest which are the most important from the beginning and then during progression we are adding more and more and more but we don't want to make sure the feeling that you know the game is like too, too, um, too intensive from the very beginning. And I would even say yeah. that uh, by mistake, we did it with the first version of a demo. I don't remember <laughs> exactly in which, in which uh, media they brought it, but we were like compared to Dark Souls. It was like they said that this is like a Dark Souls survival, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the natural thing, the thing, the best thing to do is compare anyone to Dark Souls. <laughs> yeah, it's always it's the, works. It's the thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! But it was not. It, it wasn't our intention, you know. It wasn't. So we needed to figure yeah. out what to do with it. Uh, well, now you've just found a new difficulty level, right? You can have the the Dark Souls intense <laughs> for the real hardcore survival gamers. Um. <laughs> I am sure they'll yeah. love that. <laughs> how how do you balance that? Because um, obviously you can't lead the player too much because then it, it kind of takes that feeling of gratification of, oh, I figured out this cool thing on my own, like really having that sense of almost pride, I guess, of, of being able to puzzle it out themselves, but also giving them enough where they do realize, um, like, oh, I can, I can do this. Kind of like what you were saying with the floating debris, how you had to sort of lead the players into realizing that they can mine those resources. How do you balance that with the other kinds of mechanics in the game? It's a good question, and I, I would even say it's it's one of the tough, the toughest things when you're creating survival game and sandbox game. It's, it's really hard, you know, to direct what players will do in which order. So um, we trying to create a map of how much time do we want player to spend, you know, of creating some kind of tool. How much time do we want player to spend before he will able to progress to get to new locations? Um, and by going to different locations, we are mostly gating them. So when you're gonna see a different type of locations from the very beginning, you will need to first of all create a tool or upgrade that will allow you to get there. So these are our like that's what I'm doing now tool. Yeah. So 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 these are tools that that we can like used to measure if we're going in a direction we, 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 we wanted. Of course, it doesn't mean that if we're gonna check, you know, that we want to have a tool every five minutes, it will be enough, or maybe 10 minutes, or maybe, you know, 12, because then we need to make sure that they are giving enough um, new possibilities. So, um, so then we need to check if tool is good enough, if it's giving enough fun. Uh, and these things we are trying to measure with community. So even right now, like yesterday or maybe two days ago, we uh, deliver a new milestone. And one of our thing was that, okay, let's send it. We have like a close latest that Hello.
Hi, Greg. What happened? There was a, sounds like there was a little hiccup on the server side, so we'll be back on soon. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I, I, I was thinking, is it might, did, did I do something? I've stopped the stream now. So I thought it might have been on, on you me. Can... Oh, you're good. We're, we're on. We can be heard. We're, we're back in business. So we'll yeah, need to cool. pull that back up so we can get back into gameplay, but. <laughs> I hope I saved it. <laughs> I just panicked so I saw everyone was frozen. <laughs> to be fair, we still like, we can just I guess I guess now we could just jump straight to the uh <laughs> the ending of the demo, I guess. If I haven't. Yeah, if you want. Saw... There was one thing that I was I just quit in a panic, like ah. <laughs> Don't worry, Greg. Don't worry. We are okay. <laughs> Everything Everything's okay, Greg. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not your fault. Don't worry. Not this time. Yeah, yeah. This is not this time. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's not your fault either. These things just happen sometimes. Don't worry. Um, I did have one that... intrusive thought while you were yeah, playing okay. that I kind of want to follow through on, and that's what happens if you eat the dawn moth without cooking it. I just. Oh, you just uh, you just lose some five percent of your health. That's all. But um. Ah, oh, okay. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not recommended. Health. <laughs> no, definitely not. No, sure like I say, it. cook your food, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in the demo, I don't think you get any diseases from me to get in the demo. In the demo. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So oh, unfortunately, good. unfortunately, you know, we are like getting to the point where uh, our time limitation would take care of what Greg was doing, but I believe it's it's happened exactly at the moment where, where stream uh, froze. Um, it planned. But the good thing <laughs> yeah, but the good thing is we have we have a backup for that. Um, and yeah, we wanted to show you what players like what was the ending experience for player and we want to like to discuss this a little bit more. So when like before starting we are, we were talking about trailer and the video, this is the moment I would really like to to show it right now. If we yeah, can, of course. Absolutely. We'll see. <laughs> when designing the world of forever skies, our goal was simple. Create a world of wonder and curiosity. Ruined. A place forever lost. A unique journey for each and every player. Full of mysteries and challenges. Where science is the key to survive. What remnants from the past will you discover? Reaching out of the clouds. Welcome to Forever Skies. Yeah, so I believe it's it's time when we're gonna talk about a little controversial decision that we made. Um, and one of them was that why we decided to go with time limitation because you know we were able to be in the middle of your playthrough and like today we had a frozen stream like normally in a playthrough demo would end no matter what you would do uh, yeah and it was mostly made because first of all uh the demo was created like in a very hurry mode. So we knew like we had a bigger part of game. It's not like, you know, that this is like trailer that was in the end was from actual you know, gameplay that we had. So we decided to limit it. But at the same time, we were not able to like balance, check, you know, understand everything for the whole game. So we're trying to just limit the experience and be sure that uh, it won't be like, you know, not too cool. Um, and other perspective is from marketing. You know, that it's really cool that 
uh, we are leaving players with the feeling that they want more. And it was really cool that we directed in a, in a way that we showed trailer that gives a different mechanics. And then in the next thing that is happening after trailer is a screen when you can see, when you could saw the button add to wish list. And it was one of the most important things that we achieved, uh, like from the perspective of Steam and people that other our game to, to, to their wish list. Uh, it was really cool to see, you know, when streamers were watching game, the playing game, and then it came down and it was like, yeah, <gasps> okay, a two wish list. Yeah, and they were pressing instantly after trailing because they were so hyped. And um, yeah. we did it because we saw a very cool disc talk about how to, you know, how, how you should market your game, how to prepare the game for, for something like Steam Next Fest or other public events. Um, as a indie developers, uh, we are not able, you know, to compare with big companies marketing. It's not how we can do, like, get our attention. So we need to try to work around it. And I, I, from our perspective, making demo, going public, and making sure that you are talking with community, that you are, you know, like uh, hearing it and trying to make sure that they, they, the, the people are getting what they want and it, it's working. So it's not just a promise. This is working demo. Um, gives you a huge opportunity to uh, have product that is like visible for the players. Uh, in our case, uh, it, the results are that we are right now at the 55th position at the top global wish list. Uh, we have like more than 200,000 people added game, 150,000 people of players added our game to wish list, and so on and so on. And always, you know, if I can like suggest something for other indie studios, always try to create demo, always try to get on a Steam Next Fest, always try to think about how to make sure that players are able to 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 go from your game directly on on steam or maybe epic whatever where you are selling it uh or will sell it and in our case it was really important to implement steam uh, steam api it was cool that it was very easy on, on unreal so after pressing just a button at the wish list player was directly moved to 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 steam page and even we tried to make sure that button on a steam page will be in the middle of screen, so you don't need to look around. You know, you, you will know exactly where, where where to press again the the, the, the second time. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was really cool because we felt that people with with knowledge about what is Forever Skies, what can expect more, and uh, yeah, and from that moment, uh, we know that there was a lot of people talking about yeah, why the timer? Yeah, the basic idea was that we are afraid of you know showing too much, giving too much of playthrough. Uh, so limitation that we found that marketing aspect that could help here to increase possible sell in the future. Uh, but from that moment, we are trying to, to give more. So at the very beginning, it was just 20 minutes of gameplay. Then we move it to 30 minutes. And then during Christmas, like you saw the Christmas tree, when you're going to pick it and when you're going to pick a data, uh, the small card that is close to it, you will start a Christmas a quest. In a reward, we are removing completely time limitation for a demo. So right now, when you are playing, you just need to finish one quest, and then you have like infinity uh, demo that you can uh, build the ships you want. Of course, there are like some parameters that that, that will limit. Maybe in the future we're gonna move them. Uh, but it was really important that from the beginning, when there was like a huge peak of interest, we were sh we were like very very sure that this game is working. Yeah, so it's another important lesson that, that I believe we should all learn that today games should be really prepared for the launch. It's like yeah, gamers expected. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's and there's so many things to juggle for a launch as well. So I can't imagine it's a an easy thing to do either. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, it's so it's it's it should stress, you know, I'm uh, I, I think I didn't tell it, but I'm working like for 12, maybe maybe more uh, years in the game industry. I, I had the opportunity to like uh, finish few games to 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 make them being in a sale, and it's like one of the hardest thing 
from my perspective. You know, the moment where you need to press this, this is ugly button, launch a game, because from that moment, you'd never know what's going to happen. You never know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, to see. Yeah. I I feel like people always tend to think about the actual like development itself as being the hard part and not necessarily the the letting it go. It's like letting a child go grow up, you know, like all right, live live on your own now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember so you know, we can always now always try to prepare to being ready for that moment we need to make sure that our our child will not like um broke from the very beginning but but still it's gonna leave its it, itself you, you will never know exactly what players will do what's gonna happen around maybe you know you will have everything prepared for for like 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 100 everything is ready but then you are pressing launch button at the same time different game have like the same mechanics or something like that we'll never know um yeah. so yeah a lot of things can can, can go wrong um and this is thing you know that we learned very from very beginning like uh when we are making a games we should be prepared for different scenario it's like not always the optimistic but maybe sometimes the more pessimistic way uh and we should always try to think about it's not only about development. Of course, I, I, I think that all of us will say that we love creating games, but uh, it's not only about creating it. It's that after you, you made it, you need to make sure that it will give you just enough money to be able to like survive to <laughs> just, just that part. And it's really hard you now. Like every, every, I guess everyone knows how many titles are launched every month. And like we, we have a huge competition we have a huge number of titles there are a lot of them are really great and then is the question why people should be interested about the game you are making mm. yeah absolutely there are not many games where we boiled moth whilst flying on a uh, airship across a toxic wasteland so yeah there's a usp <laughs> <laughs> this is true that feels like a very unique experience <laughs> Just, just say. <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. Oh, I am so excited to actually go. I'm probably gonna have to download the demo and just mess around in there myself because I personally really love survival games. So just going through the bit that you showed here, I'm itching now to go and dive in myself. I also personally love the idea of it being a timed demo because exactly like you're saying, if you're really caught up in the moment and you're in the middle of something and it's like thanks for playing you're just no i need more wish list right now it's genius <laughs> it's a um, it's it's it certainly has its pros and cons obviously you know you're not going to please everyone with that you know there are different ways that it, it, it could be done but i think honestly with that with what we're trying to do and try and get people wanting wanting more because you know there are there are plenty of people who say oh well it's just annoyed me more than anything so you're not going to please everyone <laughs> you know but yeah. for the majority like people understand why we do it and you know we want people to keep coming back so this is why we do it yeah and then you also get fun little uh quirks like people figuring out how they can bypass your door with their own battery and do more in the demo <laughs> than they initially could have <laughs> that's it you know there, there, there's there's like uh people within our discord they're all going here's a bunch of tricks you can do to try and you know get the most out of the demo by you know making sure you've got two engines before you take off make sure you've got this make sure you've got the battery for the build so so yeah <laughs> as a community it's great to see that they're all coming up with ways to sort of try and circumvent the timer as, as best as they can <laughs> it's quite funny to see <laughs> Yeah, really, what you're doing is you're enabling the speed running community. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I say, remember, really, we had this some idea. In Discord, yeah. We had idea, you know, that we maybe should give a rewards after finishing a demo. So you had like a summary, you found that, you found that, you found that. And then we would like, you know, the players to repeat demo over like a few times before they, they fully are able to see everything in it. 
But then we came to the conclusion that this is not in sur- this is not survival game. You know, this is like against the the foundation of that kind of titles. Uh, so we like decided no, let's don't do it. Um, instead, we are trying like mostly to expand demo. Like we said, yeah, right now we are removing timer uh, just one, one, by quest. Maybe in the future we'll remove it completely. Uh, and by that, it's cool because. Right now we are able to expand demo, so like we are sometimes giving new uh, items, new new devices, or new new part of that you are able to place on ship. So uh, we we are able to sometimes test things. And for example, it was like uh, one of the things we wanted to 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 see how it's working was with Christmas event. I, I'm not sure. Uh, if survival games are doing it. So like there is not, not, not many times I saw the seasonal events in, inside the game. In our case, we tried to do it and we got like quite cool positive feedback. So maybe we will think about it, adding that mechanics to full game too. Uh, but this is like cool that we can interact with player and see instantly how they are seeing the changes that were in a demo. Uh, and it's really cool because again, we can hear what they like, what they don't like, and we can adjust it. Uh, in a way that you know that, that that we can hope that we will be better prepared for early access. You know, <laughs> give yourself all the tools you possibly can. <laughs> yeah, awesome. That's there was exactly one thing it. that uh, we already talked about this a little bit before the stream started, but I want to give chat the moment to be just as horrified as I was. I don't know. If anyone in chat noticed during the trailer, but that is, there is that split second where yeah. you lay down in the pod and there was like the laser going up you. And I I would love for you to reiterate to everyone what that was about, because it's horrifying and I would love for them to know. <laughs> <sighs> so uh, I'll take this one if you like. Um, so many of you out there might be familiar with uh, the Alien franchise, specifically this is from Alien 4, which I believe is Resurrection. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's Alien Resurrection. Um, and in that in that movie, there is a scene where Sigourney Weaver believes she might have an alien inside of her. She enters this pod and uses like a like almost like a uh, an X-ray machine and moves it around her body, looking for fit, looking for you know, an alien embryo in that case. But we thought that'd be a really, really cool idea to try and help discover, you know, because there are viruses in our game and, you know, among among other things. So we thought it'd be a really sort of cool way to try and discover problems that the, that the, that the scientist, our protagonist might have. So that's basically what that is, yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, you, you only see like a very quick glimpse of it there. There is obviously a lot more to it. There's a lot more hands on, and you can control it yourself. And it's really, really cool. And we can't wait for players to see more of it. But yeah, it is kind of horrifying without the context of it. <laughs> yeah, you know, Honestly, the, the, the fact that you're with context, the, it's horrifying. Yeah, well, that's the true. Fact that you're able, the, the, the fact that you're able manually, like, you know, take control of the whole tool and you are doing everything by your hands and you are just, yeah. I'm not sure if in, in the actual develop, the actual part of development, it's a, like a camera that is showing you uh, that you are seeing how it's locked uh, from like in front of you. Uh, maybe we, mm-hmm. we can just remove it. I'm not sure about it exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a very intensive experience of what's happening there. And as I remember, there was a prototype of what's going to happen if you need to do something close to your eye. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Dead Space 2 all over again. I was about to say, I'm getting flashbacks. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. Oh but, my god! Oh, we are not sure that's if it's gonna stay. Well, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, we are able to do it, but I'm not sure if it's gonna stay. It's like we, we still need to progress uh, because it's it's gonna be definitely part of the under dust locations loop. So there are like more advanced viruses. There are more advanced stuff there. Uh, right now we are working on it, but as it's still in development, it's really hard to say exactly what's gonna stay for 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 early access. For sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. But we had a lot of fun of doing it, that's definitely. <laughs> I can tell. And we're very uh, excited for early access as well. So you'll be too. here before we know. I'm also very excited for early access time. 
it's the important part of, awesome. of, 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 of game. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's, totally it's, it's with early access, I think I'll say, I don't know if we'd already, uh, whilst I was playing, I don't know if, if, if it came through, because I know we had a crash there briefly, but I was saying, you know, as, a, as part of my job as community manager, it's great at being a part of an early access title because you really do sort of create it together, both as a studio, it's good for us because we get feedback straight away. It's right there from players, uh, you know, and also it's cool for them because, you know, they, 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 get, they get early access to the title and, you know, they help together with us making something great. And my job being sort of the connection between both studio and uh and, and and players is 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 really awesome and it's a lot of fun and it's my first like i said before like i said at the start it's my first uh uh project within the video game industry and yeah it's uh i think it's a really great place to start <laughs> yeah and like i say yeah. you know you don't, you don't see too many indie, indie studios with community managers uh you know because i you find yourself when you do you've you find yourself wearing an awful lot of hats as well because it's not just <laughs> community side as well. There's also everything related to content, social media posting. You know, I use I use the Adobe packages almost daily. You know, as well as being inside Steam forums every day, Discord. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of cool. And like I say, another thing is if you if you can like it's if you if you if you in your indie studio if you can if, uh, you know have a social media person or a community manager um you know there's loads of things you can sort of tip our hat to as well so it's uh it's definitely worth it if you can yeah absolutely i feel like i'm biased if i agree also being a community manager <laughs> you can agree we need like to stick I'm together just trying, <laughs> i'm just trying to ensure job security at that point but i <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think having uh, that kind of interaction with your community, especially as an indie, is super important because yeah. exactly like yeah. you said, you can grow it together and really build a bond with your players, which I feel can actually end up being pretty unique to an indie studio versus a really big one. I think the larger a studio is, the the harder it is to make that connection between yourselves and your players. So being able to, it, it sounds like you're growing your studio and still being able to maintain that level of connection with your players while you do so is yeah, a very exactly special it, yeah. thing. It is. It's, it's really awesome. Yeah, for sure. It's cool to be a part yeah. of. Absolutely. <laughs> There's, um, I saw a couple of, of questions in from chat while we were talking about potentially adding in, you know, self-surgery on parasites and stuff. They're, they're curious <laughs> about <laughs> um, some other potential features. Uh, one of them was, there was a question on if you're going to be implementing like NPCs or other people that also exist in the world, or is it supposed to feel a little more barren? So with humans, we are not exactly sure right now how it's going to evolve because we are mostly working around, you know, the survival experience and um, Earth is mostly up, like empty right now. We want to show like a little bit. Uh, I will go a little what's the uh, in, in the opposite direction just for a second. So. Uh, our initial idea behind Forever Skies was to uh, a little bit uh, implement uh, like a lore or, or like a basic idea uh, around topics that are like real problem in the world right now. Uh, one of them is a little bit connected with ecology. So, for example, in Poland, where most of our development team is, or marketing and development team is, is living, uh, sometimes we are like receiving messages that are saying, you shouldn't go away from your home if you don't need you, because right now the, the uh, current um, the, 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 the current state of the earth is like, it could damage you. You sh shouldn't go away from your home, yeah? So in better closed yeah. windows. And it's not like really cool when you have message from like, you know, government that's saying stay home. It's, it doesn't sound cool. Um, and close your windows time, as well. Yeah, close the windows. It's, 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 it's strange. Uh, and I know that Poland is not the only, only place around the world that had that problem. Uh, 
but when we started to think about forever skies, one, we, we found that one of scientists said that if you want to breathe with clean air, you need to live 100 meters above uh, ground. So that was very basic idea of why people in our world would like to go above the dust. Of course, it's a game, so we needed to twist it a little more harder than what's happening around the world. But it's we wanted to solve. Yeah, we wanted to so show some dystopian vision of how world could end, uh, possibly if we want to think about what we are doing right now. Um, so in that case, we believe that much more stronger feeling of what's gonna happen, uh, what, what bad could happen if is is that if the earth is completely abandoned, that the humans are not able to live there anymore. Uh, so this is. Like, I know it took a long time, but this is to answer, you know, if we're going to implement NPC. So right now we are not thinking about it because it's a little bit against uh, the, the story behind uh, Forever Skies. Mm -hmm. um, but about AI, uh, definitely. So first, like, because the Earth was abandoned and humans were not living there, the world below the dust, like, you know, Earth will always adapt. We believe it, that, they will that, that it could adapt and it was just like, said to humans, go away, we don't need you there, but it survived. Yeah. So it's evolved and you will be able to see, to find different AIs uh, going below dust. That's awesome. Yeah. I. It sounds to me like depending on where you are vertically, it's a very different game. It sounds like the higher up you are, the more happy, easy go. I go look at this beautiful sunset. I can fish off the side of my boat and enjoy my day. And then the lower you get, the more it's, oh, this is absolutely horrible. And there's all these horrifying creatures around me and I hate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so now you know when we it's, started. I mean, it's pretty from spot the point on, where... yeah. <laughs> yes, when we started from the point where people were comparing us to Dark Souls, you know, what would be below dust? So we needed to lower the yes, so we needed to lower the challenge from the beginning. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's it was one of the hardest thing I would say to manage it from production perspective because there are two separate games, and when we are trying to create loop and and all the progression above the dust. At the same time, we needed to make sure that below dust is fitting that. So we had, I, I even not sure how many times we we're trying to decide where players should be able for the very first time to go below the dust. So it was like, we are talking, maybe it should be from the very beginning. Maybe it should be like end game. Maybe it should be mid game. Maybe just in after two hours. So, you know, it was like constantly we we're trying to figure out how to solve the, the how to fit that, the two parts together. And uh, we, when we created the first prototype of under dust location, I believe it was like maybe two years ago, maybe maybe even a little bit later, uh, earlier, uh, we we came to a huge problem because we realized that uh, they are they are so completely different games that you should have like you know expanding of every rule of what's happening below dust. So we needed to find a way how to make sure that all mechanics, all the uh, main uh, balance features are really represented in the same way below the dust and give player like a learn like use the same mechanics that that they learn but again adding new stuff there so we need to figure out how to make progression under that so it won't be like we are going below for the very first time and you are able to see completely everything still you will need to progress you will need to find new tools you will need to Maybe sometimes find new virus, then you will need to modify it to be able to go to deeper parts of under dust location. So then maybe you realize that under dust location is like um, more deep experience. But it was, I would say, it was really, uh, really big challenge uh, to to try, you know, to make it like working together. Um, yeah. And I believe it, it could be because we are a small team. So it's not like, you know, we have one designer respons responsible for below the dust, the second is responsible above the dust, and then someone who is trying to combine it together. This is like mostly the same team, the same people. So when we are focusing on one part of the game, we're forgetting about the second part of the game. So like we're moving a lot of time around the circle, uh, uh, around 
uh, and around and around. But finally, uh, it's really cool to say it because uh, last milestone was exactly about how we want to make sure that below the dust location is working with about the dust. And after two years, we can say we did it, but it took us like exactly two years to make sure that these two locations are fitting to, to, to each other. Yeah, I can't even imagine that would, like you said, it's exactly like building two games into one, but still having them manage to blend together without completely feeling separate. That's yeah, without so breaking any that kind is of immersion a challenge. The players too, yeah. Yeah. Well, you certainly didn't choose the easy path, did you? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Easy path's boring. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> you, you, you can see below me, there's uh, the logo of our company, it's Far From Home. And literally, this Far From Home means that we want to go a little bit more from our comfort zone and be ambition. Uh, so that's like corresponding a little bit about this project. Uh, I'm not sure if it was, was like not too much ambition for us. Maybe maybe in a few parts, we, we, we tried to be too, we wanted to do too many things. Uh, and I would say this is this is our biggest challenge right now. So with all the expectation that we have right now, you know that, that we are on a, on the top global wish list. We gathered people around the game. We need to make sure that we will be able to deliver not too much things because if we would do it, then because of that probably it would be good quality. So you know, at, but the other side, as a developer, you want to like be perfect in everything you are doing. You never know when it's good enough uh, to say, yeah, that, that, that's, that's all for now. So this is one of the biggest challenge, uh, challenge for our studio right now, because everyone knows, yeah, we have a few months before we're going to release a game. So, you know, like put everything there, let's more and more and give, give them more, more mechanics. You know, it needs to look better and so on. Uh, yeah, huge pressure and huge, huge, huge uh, risk. Uh, but still, it's it's. I believe it's really important that you know, around that there are people that are trying to to help all the team to to go in a direction that that will say, yeah, this is this is all that we need. We can do it in update. We can do it in patch. Uh, just don't waste your like twenty four hours a day of of the reading stuff uh, because that can hurt game. But. From my perspective, I never saw, you know, that the plan will tell you what is just enough to be able to launch a game. I never saw it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can, there's some struggle there for sure. Um, I, one of my favorite sayings is optimization and scope are the two hardest parts of game development. It's not the ideas. It's not, sometimes it's not even building it. It's just making sure that it doesn't, Keep going forever and ever, <laughs> yeah. and that people can actually That's play it, it right? Because there is, exactly. we could also put a bajillion polygons into something and uh, all eight K textures and you know all the the good stuff. But then as soon as someone tries to download it, it takes them three days and then makes their computer explode. So it's <laughs> the two <laughs> hardest. It happens. <laughs> Try to find the balance. Try to find the balance. Yeah. <laughs> awesome well there's i i want to take it back a little bit to the beginning here and i am curious since obviously surprise surprise to anybody in case you didn't know this was built in unreal um and i i'm curious what exactly brought you to use unreal for this game in particular so um we knew from the very beginning that uh, we need to create a game that will outstand a little bit. Maybe not like completely, but will outstand. And we needed to choose a technology that will allow us to do it. So, you know, as a small team, um, you need to make sure that you have advanced technologies so you are able to create something very unique and very cool. Uh, at the same time, we know that we want to go in a direction of I would say double A games. Uh, it's still not triple A, but we know that we want to have a cool quality. Um, so we wanted to make sure that you know we're gonna have the ability to create cool 
visual aspect, but um, it will work pretty cool uh, from FPP perspective. And we know that Unreal is just perfect for it. Uh, we work, some of us worked in the previous company using it. So it was like quite uh, obvious that, that we, should, we should go in that direction. Um, from the very beginning, we were thinking about maybe we should switch to Unreal 5. Uh, it's really tempting, I would say, but at the same time, uh, as, a, as a startup, you know, as a first project, we wanted to make sure that we are using very stable technology that is known. So that was like a very perfect to, to, to start for using Unreal 4. And uh, it was a cool moment from, because when we started, I, I don't know exactly remember which, which number, which, which version it was, but uh, we were prototyping uh, how we wanted dust to look. You now it was like we were trying the, the, the dust and, and the clouds uh, above dust. Um, mm. So it was really cool to see that in one of the patches was released volumetric cloud technology and volumetric fog technology. So it was like, you know, very perfect fit for us. Um, the bad thing was that unfortunately it came out that most optimization made for volumetric cloud is uh, to players see them from below the dust, from below clouds, you know, because normally in the games you're below clouds, not above. Uh, so or from in that them. point we yeah, needed to right. <laughs> yes, or in them. So we needed to find another solution for it. Uh, but fortunately, Niagara helped us a lot, you know, with creating this this point of view uh, that we have right now. It, it wasn't like I wouldn't say it was an easy process. It took us a lot of time, but but we were able to do it. Uh, with, 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 with Unreal and we're really happy about it. And right now we're at the moment where when we are showing game to players, uh, they are seeing screenshots that they know, okay, this is from Forever Skies. This was very important to get to this, to this point and we are, we are there. So we're really happy about it. Yeah. Yeah. There definitely are some very unique, um, scenes and, and views. I, I know even from the, uh, you know, the, the images that you have on your Twitter and on your Steam and stuff, when you were in the demo, there were moments where I was like, oh, I know this. Yeah, this is, <sighs> this is recognizable exactly as this game. So I, I totally agree that you have, you've nailed the theme and it is very recognizable for Forever Skies and for your specific That's really awesome uh, to hear. That's, yeah, yeah, that's really, really good to hear. It's mm -hmm. give it a unique kind of gimmick, maybe is the right word, I guess, or look. <laughs> so yeah. Brand so that feedback different. from you, Tina, that's really great to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, I know that working in Unreal is not always just, you know, a trip through the daisies. There is sometimes some difficulties. And I know, like you just mentioned, um, having the issue with you need to also be in and above clouds. So you had to tamper with some stuff there. I was curious if there were any other challenges that you had faced while developing in Unreal and maybe how you got around that. So definitely the biggest challenge for us was was uh, creating this dust the, 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 and clouds. So this was the, the, the biggest one. The second, uh, I would say it was about um, the fact that we wanted to postpone going in a direction that we are using custom engine. So we are mostly like uh, trying to make sure that we are able to get all up updates, all patches integrated in our, in our uh, game uh, in an easy way. It's mostly because you know, we are like sometimes using technology from different companies like or maybe like right now we are have uh, FSR. We have like technology from AM, uh, from from Nvidia, the DLSS in our game. Uh, but it's not all, you know. Even when we are talking about, for example, uh, consoles. So so we we needed to make sure that we are like aligned with everything that is possible that we're gonna in the future be able to 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 release our game uh, on on consoles too. And we wanted to make sure that it will be playable in a cooperative mode. So we wanted to, to make sure that we have like the most stable, the most upgraded version of Unreal. At the same time, we were like, even if we were tempted, we want we didn't want it was like not for us to change anything in a source code for a very long time. So I would say it was a little bit challenging, but uh, we hope that it was like the way we should try to do it. Like I was in a situation when um, 
in a in a game we decided to change source code from the very beginning and then we st it was very complicated to upgrade and to you know download version uh, the new updates of unreal so yeah uh, we we believe that till the moment we're usually like leaving post uh, the, the pre productions or you know you, you you are still checking the, the the pillars of a game and so on you should try to stay with not touching source code if you really don't need to but then it mm -hmm. could be yeah the cool, cool thing was that you know that after uh, launching after we saying that the the uh, the next version of Unreal is, is, is a five version of Unreal. We knew that it's a little bit too much for us at the moment, so we knew that this is this could be the moment where we're going to start working with with changes in source code. Yeah, awesome. I can, I think that's admirable. <laughs> being able to get around that and of course it, issues with source code is never fun but is also another one of those i feel kind of inevitable at some point through the process we've we all get there <laughs> eventually yeah um but yeah, i you know and... yeah. oh go ahead <laughs> oh sorry so yeah i, I wanted want to, to say you know that so, so the other thing is that, you know, as a small team and like for us, I, it wasn't said from the very beginning, but we were working for three years completely remotely. We didn't have office. So, you know, it was like we needed to find a way how to make sure that everyone is able to work, you know, how where, where code should be put. And so we didn't have like something like you know, builder or things that you can, um, press a button and it will like, create new version of engine or something like that. We are like mostly trying to work on our machines from home. So yeah, um, it, it didn't make things easier for us from the beginning. Uh, right now it's a little bit changing because like you can see, I'm, 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 I'm talking from office at the moment, uh, but it's happening after three years of working remotely. Yeah. Which is always a fun feeling that has to be a kind of a big moment for all of you, right? Having an actual like physical place to go into and feel like, all right, this is this is where we get things done now. <laughs> so I imagine so. I'm over here in the UK. The office unfortunately is in you know, Francois in Poland. So I just sort of imagine I'm there. This is this is my <laughs> office. <laughs> You're there in spirit. Yeah. I'm there exactly that's what I was gonna say. I'm there in spirit. Exactly. But the good thing is, all, all, always there is a spot for you, Greg. If you will want, you, you can. You can. There's an empty desk in the corner, gathering dust. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, it's, it's it's funny because even when you are opening office right now, it's not like meant that everyone will come to it. It's it's people. They 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 are people that prefer working from home. They are people that prefer just working, you know, like a hybrid mode. So some few days they are spending in office, some they are spending remotely. I believe that game industry changed a lot during these three years, you know, from when pandemic started and before it's a completely different industry right now and uh, the productions were completely different. But yeah, uh, Office makes definitely it, it allows people to to integrate more and this is like one of the one of the more big topics about, you know, how to create the feeling of that we are a team when we are working just remotely. It's, it's, it's really a hard topic to discuss, uh, to, 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 to solve. Uh, but the other thing is all the technology. So yeah, of course uh, you can do a lot of things right now in a cloud, but still having this, this like uh, the, the places where you have server that you have like a computer that can compute its shaders and so on. It's, it's, it could like help with a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's something special about being able to actually be with your team sometimes too i feel yeah, definitely so i do want to take a moment to first of all congratulate you for being awarded a mega grant um of course with this being mega grant week congratulations that is a huge achievement um and i i wanted to, to take a second to also give the spotlight onto the mega grant program in general. And I was curious on uh, at what point in your process and your development process, did you apply for your mega grant? So it was at the moment where um, we were, as I remember, we're, I, I believe that we are like uh, at the milestone where we are trying to make sure that we, we have 
confirmation that we know what means our unique selling points. This is how I would mm. say, say it. Um, so yeah, we had some basics. We like it was the moment where where we were like finalizing the look of dust. We had the basics of flying. We have basic idea of how world world will look. Uh, but at the same time, I mean. It was the moment I would like go from development to business perspective. It was a moment where we are like uh, trying to secure funding from you know the the next part of development. So this was like uh, this was like w w one of the moments where we were. So we we didn't go in a direction that from the very beginning as a studio we get money from I don't know publisher or some huge investor. We were going in a direction where we are like. Founding, uh, we are like raising money from private investors that like small number of money from the very beginning, uh, just enough to make sure that we are able to create prototype and to be able to create another prototype, you know, then maybe some part of a game, like step by step by step. So yeah, at, at some point we know that uh, we felt that we have something cool to show to, to, to people. And we're like looking still, okay, so what's going to be next? That was the moment where we felt, yeah, maybe we can try to apply for Epic Mega Grant. We're going we're gonna, to, uh, from one side, maybe it will help us from financial aspect. And from the other, uh, we believe it's a really um, cool way to validate uh, what people could say about your project. Is like, you know, it's, it can make sure that, it can tell you if you are going in a good direction with what you have created already. So we felt that it can help us to make sure that it's, it's, it's a good way what we are doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. That makes plenty of good sense to me. And it, so it sounds like you had, um, by the time that you did apply, um, for anyone else in the chat who might be interested in doing so in the future, would you recommend having kind of a, a playable demo or at least up to the point, it sounds like, of what you had before you applied? I will definitely always say that if you have something playable, it will help you know, to, to check what you, to, to, be, to allow easier evaluation of what, what you are doing. But at the same point, I believe it's not necessary always. It could allow you to, to, to have a bigger chances, but still, uh, from, from my perspective, you know, sometimes the problem is not about creating a demo. It's, it's more about creating the prototype or proof of concept of something very unique, very cool that you want to have in game. And mm. Like I saw a lot of times that, you know, when people are trying to create something, they say, yeah, if we want to check if it's doable, we need to do the whole game. It's not like that. You have like a different ways of checking if something would be cool. So always you can try to create a small prototype. It could be playable, of course, but sometimes you are like doing something really cool from art perspective. So maybe just creating some visualization or maybe sometimes showing that material you created in, 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 in Unreal or, or other tools that you are using could be something really unique and, and you could try to, to, to work just with that. But if you, are go, if you have something more, I believe that it could allow you, uh, it could give you a bigger chances that, that everything will, will go in a direction that you want. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense to me. Um, I don't want to take up all of your time, but we do have a couple more questions from chat. So I was wondering if both of you would be open for kind of a, a quick fire questionnaire here. Yeah, sure. Let's try. All right. So first, what I saw, they the people need to know, can they tame or have pets of any of the creatures? Can I have a pet <laughs> Don Moth? <laughs> Andre, I would say we would really love to 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 um, give that kind of opportunity. Uh, at the very beginning of early access, it will be impossible, unfortunately. It won't be impossible Fair enough, from start. But I can dream. You know, we can we, we can dream. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's are, like this is, this is the. This is like a cool say, thing in cool. community driven development. You know, if you call you know, right to us a lot of times and we're going to see that this is something that you really want, then probably Greg will talk to me every day and say, you know, 
this is exactly what we need to do and then it will be much more chances that we're going to do it that's it okay so. well you know the, and, and based on that there will the, you know so a pet is one thing uh, but our community are also very kind of asked for something quite simple as a, as a pet rock on many occasions so there might be some <laughs> inanimate objects which you can consider your pet for at the start of early access that should I'm, we're hoping that should tie them over until we can think about maybe creating something a little bit more uh you know mobile pet mug yeah <laughs> a pet bug or other things which you might see, which you will see in early access so yeah um we would definitely like to it's definitely something we, we many in the studio would like to do as well it just all comes down to you know time and priority but who knows what happens and what will happen in the future but you know yeah. how it works yeah. sometimes developers are just our team would probably look at us right now are hearing this and there is like small chances that maybe someone will say okay i will just do it without waiting for you know like it's going on a high priority sometimes this is how it works so yeah yeah. Good, that, good that they are talking right now. Maybe it wouldn't be like a business reasonable decision, but somehow maybe it's magically will happen right now. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, 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 Cyber Shell Rev. I was, so I was about to say Cyber Shell Rev in the chat just put alien pops out of chest. Ah, good morning, Terry. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> so, kudos to kudos to them. That was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're all going to come together and we're going to start a campaign where we have to request um, pet mods and pet aliens and pet rocks. And it's it's going to have to happen then. So. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Um, well, let me get to this, this list that we had here. Um, there were a lot of comments that were very impressed with your UI, and they were wondering if the UI was inspired by any other games, or if it was just, you knew that that was the kind of sort of clean, very almost digital looking, uh, way that you wanted to format it from the beginning. Uh, it's a good question. And to be honest, uh, it's really hard to say exactly if it was very clear from the beginning because we are we are working with different UI artists and we are like uh, sometimes like we are still looking with some different elements how they should look in a in a final game, um, but we knew exactly from the very I would say maybe not from the very beginning but we know that our our protagonist is scientist and we wanted to make sure that UI will. Uh, will like be telling you exactly that that you are that kind of a person. So we wanted, you know, so we knew uh, what kind of colors we want to use, what kind of uh, shapes we want to use. Sometimes we are slightly uh, changing them, but still, is, but still we want to to have that 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 feeling. And when you look at the games or movies, it's like not something completely different from sci-fi uh, scientists teams what you can see in, in in different titles so we were like inspired by a lot of games a lot of title of movies and we are trying to combine our our style within that but uh again it's a little bit hard because it it was like from the very beginning that we have our ui artist it's like changed during so from the beginning we we're working with ui artists that was working on outsource then we felt that oh we need a little bit more help and so so we started working with other ui artists right now we are talking with third ui artists uh so yeah it, it couldn't like go in a different direction yeah makes sense um they're also wondering let me find it i just lost it oh no there it is okay <laughs> thank you sure i'm getting the right no. questions pulled up here um they're wondering if there's going to be anything like cinematics or um, special moments, like when you lift off for the first time, if there's a, a special sound or audio or cinematic or anything like that for kind of those key moments. So, yeah, we are thinking about cinematic from, from for, for start, definitely uh, for the end of the game. Uh, it's really hard to say at the moment how it's going to look uh, during story mode, what kind of tools we're gonna use to uh, to tell the story inside the game? From the beginning, we were thinking mostly about environment storytelling. So you know, like um, things that you are able to see, maybe some interactive triggers, 
where you are just losing control for a moment. Uh, but as we are mostly focused right now on creating foundation for a game, like we said, a survival sandbox uh, Philly, uh, we know what will be story of a game. We have it prepared. We had a huge, huge opportunity of working with very famous uh, writer who created like a huge scope of, you know, what's a background story, what's going to happen in game. But we are like right now mostly focused on, on creating uh, just a sandbox elements, then in our production plan is mostly trying to create a cooperative mode. I'm, I'm just uh, adding this word trying to because always working on a cooperative mode is a little bit challenging. Um, yes. I, 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 I know that we're going to do it, but, 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 but just to make sure that, that people know that it's not easy process. Uh, and then after <laughs> it, we will, we, will, we will add story mode to game. That's awesome. Well, you indirectly so, answered another question, which was if there oh, was going to be multiplayer or cooperative mode. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. Now we know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. it absolutely is, and we've been it's been, Forever Skies has been in development with cooperative in our minds since pretty much day one. Uh, so we know how important it is as well to yeah survival players especially. So it will include it. It won't be available from the very start of early access, but it will probably be on one of the first. Uh, major updates during the early access process. And I guess going back to our previous question, story will also be added on on, on one of those updates as well. So that, again, it yeah. won't be available from the start, but yes to both, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, asterisk, about, eventually. <laughs> yeah, yes. About, 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 about cooperative mode, I wanted to say that uh, it was, I believe, a uh, decision uh, quite risky from the beginning because like, Greg said, we know that we want to create cooperative mode, but at the same time, we were like a little bit scared that, okay, do we able to create like a cool game and cooperative mode at the same time? Maybe we could, but we decided that let's try to focus just on the sandbox survival experience from the very beginning and then add cooperative mode. And we were a little bit afraid of it because it's a not, not normal way of how you are like, you know, going to early access, like typically ways that you have, if you are going in a cooperative mode and you have it from the very beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't know if it's going to be okay. Uh, from cool thing is that uh, during that, the, 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 during this, this years, um, to Green Hell was added cooperative mode, and it was in the same way. So they started as a single player, and they they, they introduced a cooperative mode in the game. So we know that uh, it went pretty well, and it was like confirmation. Okay, so maybe we are not so stupid, but we will see, of course, how it's gonna end with us. <laughs> it's gonna work out great. It's gonna be great. <laughs> let's hope so. Let's hope so. Yeah, it will be. It will work out great. It will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, and uh, good to hear. And uh, I wanted to say that, yeah, it's not like, you know, that we are postponing working cooperative mode, like till the end of productions. Uh, we were creating mm -hmm. prototypes. We are checking if players are able to uh, join together to, to, to play from the very beginning. Um, so w one of the reasons was, like, well, one of the ideas was that we need to make sure that uh, uh, architecture that we are using will work in cooperative mode. So we decided to use game playability system. Uh, knowing that it could require from the very beginning a little more of knowledge, how to use it. It's not like you know, we're just opening Blueprint that we're able to do whatever you want. You need to learn how to use that tool. But we know that this tool is meant to replicate, that this is meant mostly for that allow you then when you're trying to create cooperative mode or multiplayer game, then you have huge benefit of using that technology. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um... We're technically at time. I have three more questions I want to ask you. Are you down for just three more? And then I will release Yeah, you. let's do it. Okay. Absolutely fine. Um, there was one that just popped up where uh, they're wondering if Steam achievements are a planned inclusion for the future. Yeah. And again, it's probably, uh, probably not from the start of early access, but when 1.0 launches, absolutely, yeah, Steam achievements will be a part of it. Sure, of course. Yeah. Awesome. Will some of them be ridiculous? That's a me question. <laughs> that's a, that's up to me. 
<laughs> I've done something how ridiculous I want it to be. Oh no! Now I'm scared. <laughs> oh, I've, I've, oh, I've had some thoughts. You know. <laughs> That's the most ominous laugh you've had this whole day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll see what we'll come up with. But yeah, uh, it was, it was, we'll see. But absolutely, there will be definitely be Steam achievements. When it will be included into early access is hard to say. But yes, it will. And I can't wait to start creating the, uh, the achievement list. Awesome. <laughs> we have a great suggestion for an achievement for you in chat here where um, they, they'd they like an achievement for leaving their friend on a building and flying away in the ship. <laughs> and then and then extracting the scaffolding so they fall with the building after it collapses. Yeah. <laughs> Evil! <laughs> I mean, it didn't matter if I said it or not, somebody was going to try it. So... <laughs> I might as well come out and say Achievements for bullying your friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trolling your friends. It's the only way. It's the only way to show that you really love them, you know? Of course. Of course. Is to toss them into the yes. abyss. <laughs> They'll respawn back. <laughs> <laughs> and then the yeah, last it's a great idea. It's a, it's a good idea. You. It is. It, it was a good one. <laughs> The last two questions are in um, regards to the story mode that you were saying, and I'll just put them together because I feel like they can kind of relate. The first one is they're wondering if progress is linear or if it can potentially be completed maybe out of order. And then the follow-up question is, is there a definite ending to the game? Because most survival games, obviously, you can kind of continue to play them into infinity until there is literally nothing else you could possibly do. Um, but is there a, a definite cutoff for your game instead? So it's, it, it's, it's difficult to say at the minute, but more than likely what is going to be the case is when it comes to the story mode, yeah, there will be a definite ending. Like there, there, there will be a point where it where it, where it comes to an end. I think I think I think most players as well will probably agree that that's probably the best approach. Like you can absolutely right with survival games keep on playing, but there should be more than likely a, a, a moment when it stops. On terms of progression, like the uh, on terms of actually like progressing the story and moving forward, that in itself the story is linear. But you know you can just do the story as and when you want to. If you want to just spend some time just relaxing in the toxic wasteland and just you know chill out on your airship one day maybe do a bit of crafting a bit of research you don't have to go ahead and keep on working with the story you know you can do that at your own pace um mm -hmm. and you know instead why not just go off and explore and come back to it when you feel up to it you know, there's, we, we don't want to put any sort of even though the story itself would be linear you know it's it's still a procedurally open, procedurally generated open world above the dust mm -hmm. so yeah we wouldn't want it to be too linear we don't want to have to hold players' hands too much. And, you know, they should be able to get around to the story as and when they want to. Some people will go straight for it. Others might be taking their time a bit more. You know, we want to leave it up to the players. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of players that want, you know, focus mostly on creating the great ship and trying to unlock new new kind of decorations, new kind of uh, um, building uh, bricks that they can give them a unique uh, uh, unique look. Uh, we're seeing that there, is a, there are players that mostly love exploration so for them it could be possible and there are the players that really lo like like to you know progress story uh, in a game so like they can do whatever they want in the order they want uh, there will be probably some parts where you need to go through the gate and they will require some tools but i believe that we shouldn't like focus on creating that there is only one gate at one time you can you know go in a left direction right direction maybe we'll see a different type of location so you will be able to decide in which order you want to go down mm. yeah, yeah that's true yeah awesome well i i'm a bit of a liar just because there's one there's one more question <laughs> that just I, came I, in, I see i, I saw it and it's a yeah. really good one <laughs> Yeah, it's a really right. good question, so I want to ask it. And it'll be the last one, I promise. <laughs> um, how does your team navigate working simultaneously on the same maps and levels? Do they 
wait for check-in, out of source control, level streaming, or um, what's your process for that? Good question. Whoa. So it's really complicated because in our case, um, we have like, I can go very deeply with, that, with the answer, but I want to make sure that we're gonna like not spend one hour here. So because we are using <laughs> uh, generation here, um, part of the things that, that you can see are like just blueprints. So for example, building is blueprint, but at the same time, room in the building could be different blueprint. So it's just randomized by blueprints itself. So sometimes uh, we are working on the maps, sometimes we're working on blueprints. So there are situations where we can work like in the same time on a, on a different parts of, of a map. But normally it's not working pretty well. So we are trying you know, to make sure that, uh, for example, gameplay is focused on that kind of location and art is like working on a different location. So then if someone finished his work, then for example, we have like, okay, gameplay finished the, the uh, the, the, the past. So right now our, our art is going to try to make these locations look prettier. Yeah. After art finished working, then we are going to get back to gameplay. Uh, and with uh, good thing is that we, for a very long time, uh, were like having only one level designer. So it wasn't like they were fighting against each other. Um, how, who, who could do things? Uh, but Another cool thing is that because we have this under those locations and above those locations, so uh, sometimes part of team is working above the dust, sometimes below the dust, but this is something new for us. It was impossible for the three years previously. Right now we are trying to, you know, find a way how people can work more seamlessly. Yeah. Well, awesome. I want I want to personally dig so much further into that, but like you said, I don't want to stay here for the full hour. So I might just pick we'll your brain to, about it later myself. But <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to come back. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll just have to come yeah. back on uh, once early access is out, and we'll play even more of it, and I can pick your brains even further for more information. Yeah, okay. sounds good. Yeah, great. Right. <laughs> this has been fun. Thank you awesome. very much for having us. Of course, thank you both for coming on and playing your game and showing us all the cool, wonderful aspects of it, as well as the potentially horrifying bits, especially that we got to see in the trailer. I uh, pre appreciate getting to see the whole <laughs> spectrum of gameplay here. Um, before oh, I let wait, you we go- We can't wait to show you more of that. We can't wait to play I'm to see so more excited. of that, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you go, um, do you want to let anyone in the chat know where they can find you or reach out if they have any other questions about the game or if they want to join your community? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, follow us on Twitter if you're over there at Fly Forever Skies. Um, as well as that, feel free to join in, join in our discussions on the community tab on our Steam page. And also that we have a Discord. We all have links on that. That can also be accessed from our, ste from our uh, Steam page. Uh, Unreal Engine is currently linking everything in the chat, so please feel free to click in and come speak, come chat to us devs. We're nice people. We have cookies. Yeah, and all developers have access to our, you know, community Steam, uh, community Discord. So, like, it's not like it's hard to ask our question to us directly. You can always use Discord for that. Awesome, Definitely. fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for coming on today. Like I said, very excited to see what you've built. Very excited to see where it goes. I know I'm personally going to be playing the hell out of it. <laughs> but thank you so much for taking the time. And um, I know you're busy, especially with getting all this in. So thank you so much for coming on for the couple hours I held you hostage here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not just a pleasure. Fun. And thank you. Yeah. yeah, and thank you really much for, for you know, being, that, that you allow us to be, be here. It was like a huge, huge pleasure. And we believe that um, if, if there will be always opportunity, we would really lovely talk more about the you know, development process, about what we have learned. Maybe, maybe there's some knowledge in it. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. Also, and, also, and also thank you to everybody who asked questions in the chat as well. Yeah. Yes. That. Yeah. That was definitely going to be the follow-up, of course, is thank you all so much for watching. Um, this is obviously the first one of this show, but your interaction just in general in the channel is absolutely appreciated. And 
the channel wouldn't be what it is without you. So thank you so much for hanging out, being here, being involved and asking questions. It makes this whole process a lot more fun because um, then I'm not just horribly holding these people hostage selfishly so I can ask them all of my own questions and you get to join in and ask your own questions too. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here as well. And for anybody who may have hopped in late to the stream, that's totally fine. We post all of our streams in video format that can be viewed on demand on both our Twitch and YouTube channels at Unreal Engine, as well as you can follow us on all social media at Unreal Engine as well. <sighs> You would think I haven't done this before. I'm out of breath. <laughs> but don't forget to also keep up with us. <laughs> don't forget to keep up with us on the forums where you can get the latest news and find all of the links associated with today's stream. So if you missed them in chat, no worries. They'll be available there on the main announcement post for the stream today. But I'll leave it there or I'm gonna die because I am out of out of breath from going through that too fast but thank you so much for coming on and thank you all for watching and i will hopefully see the rest of you next week and i will hopefully see you all around because you were lovely and i loved chatting with you thank you yep thank you very much bye, -bye. bye everyone <laughs>